Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is Tali Carr. This is the Rewind on the Pregame Show Network. Now, I cannot do this by myself here from Atlanta. We got to check in. We got to go down to the SIP, baby, and check out my man, Uncle Neely. Uh, it, it's not vacation. It's just a stopover. You, you never know where you're going to find Neely. It might be Boulder. It might be Jackson, Mississippi. Right now, it is Jackson, Mississippi. But Neely, let's start here with the news from Boulder. Um, it was time goes by so fast, Neely. I think it was just what last week you were on stage, uh, co emceeing, hosting, facilitating the conversation with Coach Prime's uh, new book. And uh, Neely, I, I think you were the one. You were the one that said it over the top. New York Times bestseller, baby. That what a way to start the show, man. Man, absolutely. You know, uh, elevate and dominate 21 ways to win on and off the field. Uh, booked by Coach Brian. He kicked off his book tour just as spring practice was getting going, uh, and it ended right before we all departed for spring break. Ended there in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, was in New York. Was there with you in Atlanta. Also, uh, Dallas and the Fort Worth, Texas area. Ended the tour in Boulder, Colorado. I did have the opportunity to help moderate that event with Dr. Stevenson from uh, UC. And, uh, man, the next day, 24 hours later, New York Times bestseller. I'm not taking credit for it. I'm just saying <laughs> that it ended with a big crescendo. New York Times bestseller, Coach Prime's book, man. Make sure you go out there and check it out. It's uh, it's really there. There it is, like right there behind me. You know, it's, it's a great book. It's a great book. Hey, he's he's been on the tour. Uh, he's made some news. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that he has said uh, here on the pregame show network. All right, Miles, let's take him through the rundown today. Well, what are we going to talk about? Where should we start with the New York Times best-selling sidekick there of Uncle Neely? I, I think spring ball, Neely, would be a good place to start today. We got one week of spring ball in Colorado. Kids on spring break this week. They'll pick it back up next week. What was the vibe? Uh, what was the difference? Uh, look, we, we, heard from, we heard from the head trainer. Even the trainer was like, yo, it's, it's, it's different. I, I, see, I see more dogs out here. Everybody was feeling it. Uh, Neely, what can you tell us is uh, just the biggest difference, man? Spring 24 uh, versus spring 23. You know, when you do that comparison, Tali, you juxtapose where we are today compared to where we were a year ago when spring practice kicked off. This team is night and day. It's night and day in size. Uh, it's night and day in mentality. Uh, it's night and day in just the culture in the building. Uh, you know, when you're on time, you're late. And you don't have guys showing up on time anymore. People in the room 10 to 15 minutes before the meeting start. Uh, you see more and more players getting in extra work before and after practice. Uh, you see a, a greater attention to detail uh, in practice. And that's not to talk about, you know, the size upgrade on offensive line and the size upgrade uh, on defensive line as well. Every singular facet of this team has gotten better. Even Shadur Sanders is back well beyond 100% healthy. Uh, Dylan Edwards is bigger, faster, and stronger. He believe he's faster. He ran track this year, you know, to <laughs> stay in game shape. All right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's it's amazing, man, how this team has bought in and upgraded in just 365 days comparison. All right, you talked about Shador Sanders. Uh, let's take a look at his stats here in a second. Uh, but one thing he did talk about at his presser last week, uh, we covered it on the pregameshow.com. Um, it's there on the YouTube channel for the Pregame Show Network. Uh, he's healthy. Uh, because he, man, he, we all saw it. He, he took that beating last year. The, the back was ailing him. Uh, if you saw uh, Coach Prime on, on his Amazon series, uh, you, you saw Shador go back, <laughs> go back under the, under the stands there, man. And he was like, holy cow, like I am taking a beating. Uh, but New Year, uh, revived body. Yeah, you know, we also have to factor in that before he missed that final game of the season, he was banged up going into that. So I would say probably the last three, if not four games, he was nowhere near 100% playing and was still putting up phenomenal numbers, you know, with a, a suspect at best offensive line or protection in front of him. Yeah, uh, You know, someone asked during the book tour in Boulder how Coach Prime feels about this offensive line. He turned to me and said, how many guys do we bring in? And I said, we brought in eight. And he looked at the questioner from the audience and said, I feel eight times better today than I did last year. Because uh, he knows the talent level who's here. Uh, he knows the experience level of who's here. And that's one of the stark differences, Tali, between this team 
last year and this year. Last year through that portal, you were getting guys who may have been in, say, Florida State, but they were on the bench at Florida State. He went after this year guys who were who have played at the Power Five level who were getting playing time. Uh, so there's no drop off in experience. But Shadur, man, is above 100. percent He's got that swagger. The back is healed. He's looking forward to working out, you know, this spring and and getting that line in front of him this fall. All right, let's take a look at Shadur Sanders' numbers uh, from a year ago. Uh, Neely, you see his completions there. Uh, he was top ten in the country at 69 percent. Uh, 394 yards rushing. He had four touchdowns. Uh, you know, it, you saw that watch at least four times. <laughs> passing yards um, and passing touchdowns. Neely, th those are a, a lot of school records there um, and could have been even more if, if he played that last game. When you look at those numbers, like what are expectations that you have uh, and you think are feasible and attainable for, for 2024? I think he's going to finish the season above 70% uh, completion. I'm going to put him somewhere between 73 and 75. Uh, I don't know how much the rushing and the rushing TDs will go up because some of that was under duress versus play call. Uh, I do believe his passing yards are going to go up quite a bit uh, because, you know, you're losing a guy like, say, a Zay Weaver, uh, but you're bringing in a transfer from, from Vanderbilt and there's no, no loss there. I think his receiver room is going to be upgraded. Uh, I think that uh, his protection is certainly upgraded. I think that the passing he's going to do in screen situations to Dylan Edwards, which leads to yards after catch, is going to be upgraded. Uh, his relationship with the offensive play caller, Pat Shermer, uh, is upgraded. So when I look at those numbers across the board, I think they're going to be increases. Uh, and I do think he's going to be sitting on that front row at the downtown athletic club being discussed and name called for Heisman Trophy winner. All right, let's go on. Continue with the rundown. We're going to move on to our next topic here. I, I like to stay on track, Neely, because I'll make some stuff up and get all over the place. So let's talk about the 2025 draft. Uh, the 2024 draft has not happened yet, but we talked about that aforementioned uh, <laughs> book tour uh, that Coach Prom is on. He was on the Million Dollars Worth the Game podcast, and he dropped some game. We reported on that at thepregameshow.com. Uh, Neely, he said, look out for, for Eli Manning part two. If, if you're old enough, you might remember uh, John Elway. You know, players showing their power, uh, where they might want to go, where they might not want to go. Uh, and Coach Prime said, look, he's got two dogs in, in the 2025 draft. And of course, we know he's talking about Shador Sanders and, and Travis Hunter. If he uh, chooses to go, that he's a year behind, but, you know, he'll be draft eligible. Uh, he said, look, my guys are going one through four. One of them's going one, and some of them cities just ain't it. Absolutely. Tali, it's amazing that I have on my father figure hoodie today because the father and father figure in Deion Sanders as it relates to Shadur and Travis Hunter respectively is who you heard talking there, not just the head coach. And much like uh, uh, Manning Sr. did when he talked about that Eli wasn't going to show up in San Diego if y'all pick him, because he knew that wasn't a, a situation uh, fit for him. Deion Sanders is saying the same thing and saying it early that, you know, these two guys are going to go in the first round and they're going to go within the first picks, if not the first pick of the first round, which means you're going to go to a team uh, that is struggling. Now, on one hand, I totally understand that what Shadur Sanders brings to the table, uh, he's played under duress. He's played for multiple offensive coordinators. Uh, he knows how to get the ball out. So, he can hit the ground running in the system, you know, that has been struggling. But you hear a father and a businessman say like, hey, when that ain't necessary, we can go to a better place that fits. You're damn right. We're going to put our foot down and do it just like you've had happen in the past in NFL. So uh, I believe that Travis Hunt and Shadur Sanders are going to be high, high, high first round draft picks. But I also believe that, you know, the father and father figure in Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, is going to let them know based on his experience, where's the best place to go and that you have the right and the power to not go where someone may want you. Hey, because we've seen it before, and I won't say there wasn't any pushback, but it was seen as exercising your power. Um, I think the narratives that are told when you look at, you know, what John Elway did, where he was like, hey, I'll, I'll go play baseball before I go to, what, what was it, Indianapolis uh, that, that he didn't want to go to? Uh, Elway didn't want to go to the Colts. Um, and then you had Eli Manning, of course, who did not want to go uh, to then San Diego and the Chargers. Uh, 
it helps uh, when your father <laughs> has been in the business <laughs> that you're going to. So look, there, there, there can't be any, oh, we didn't know that. Look, Deion Sanders can pick up the phone and call any NFL franchise. Any NFL franchise knows how to reach out. As, as Coach Prime says, he's not hard to find. So the communication uh, should be very clear um, as all these pieces start to sort out a, a year from now. Neely. Yeah, and I think that's what has to take place. It has to be clear communication that if you draft this person, they're not going to show up. But there also has to be some gravitas and believability with that. And just like you had, uh, you know, with the Manning family or the Elway family, you got that same gravitas, if not more, in the Sanders family. Believe you me, these owners and these GMs are going to know Ain't no need in trying to call Coach Prime Deion Sanders father slash father figures bluff uh, as it relates to Shadur Dan- Sh- 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 Sanders, excuse me, and Travis Hunter. So I think you're going to have the credibility there, the believability there, and the relationships and communication there that is probably going to be a problem that's not going to happen because the people who would pull that trigger know, hey man, Coach Prime ain't bluffing. Don't don't do that. And and the funny thing about, you know, and it's just the positions they play. Like, not every team is going to want Shadour based upon what their quarterback situation is. But, Neely, I don't I don't think there's a team out there that Travis Hunter would not fit on just because of, of the position and, and his capabilities and versatility. Yeah, I, I think that's well said, Tyler. You know, and this is no shade whatsoever to Shadour Sanders. He will clearly be uh, the best quarterback in next year's draft. But as you're saying, from a contract standpoint, just because your team is playing poorly and got a high pick doesn't mean you're not short up a quarterback contractually with someone else that you may have drafted in the past two or three years. But when you look at Travis Hunter's resume as an athlete that can play on both sides of the ball, even special teams if you wanted him to, you know, what team in America in the National Football League does not need that kind of talent day one every draft? You're always going to take the best athlete available you know, and then you're going to look at what your position needs are as well. But because quarterbacks sometimes can be locked up, uh, you know, Shadour is going to still go first round and go, you know, in those first couple of picks is not first pick. And Travis is going to be right there with them or ahead of him, man, because that is a once in a lifetime talent that you have in Travis Hunter. Uh, I do think I do have some hope, Neely, that, that the Falcons will Falcon. <laughs> oh, you know, you got Kirk Cousins coming in. But, oh, we're good. Uh, Kirk's 35, coming off an injury, and, you know, Atlanta's luck just – just when you think you have arrived, you you get the old Charlie Brown snatch the football away from you. So, I'm still keeping hope alive of Shador Sanders in Atlanta uh, a year from now or a year and some change. What a beautiful thing that would be. You know, the Dolphins got accused of tanking for Tua. I think you're going to have, you know, slipping for Shador or tanking <laughs> for Tua, his jersey number. And, uh, you know, the Falcons, as you know, Tali being there in Atlanta, just picked up Kirk Cousins, who's probably on the backside of his career, so he won't be there, you know, that much longer, if at all. It could line up perfectly, man, if if Atlanta's picking in that top five. But much like his father told people at the Combine years ago when he found out where they were picking, hey, no need to talk to me. I'll be gone before then. (laughs) All right, we're, we're talking about Travis Hunter. Uh, let's move on to our next subject here. This was probably the coolest story um, that you've seen in a while. Dear Mama, I have keys to a brand new house just for you. Uh, Travis Hunter, one of the top five NIL valuations. Uh, you can see that info at thepregameshow.com as well. Uh, look, he's got the money, man. And if you got the money and you don't want to take care of your mama like something's wrong and there is nothing wrong with travis hunter because he did what any good son should do uh neely you know travis much better than i do obviously i've only sat down and talked with him a couple of times but man the feeling of being able to buy your mama a house man it is there anything better than that you know shout out before we get to travis hunter's mother shout out to uh o'bannon boys in ucla who about 20 or so years ago, man, initiated the lawsuit where NIL was going to be a reality. And it took all those years for it to happen. And now you have players who don't have to wait to that signing bonus or draft day to be able to take care of mama. Travis Hunter has a heart of gold, uh, excellent relationship with his mother who, you know, brought him here to Jackson State and has seen him, you know, move on to Colorado and do well. And long before his name is called on draft day, long before he signs a contract with the NFL team, is already in a position to take care of his family, take care of his younger siblings, and get his mom a house. 
you know, unbelievable testament uh, to what NIL now means to these collegiate athletes and how you can, you know, have your money managed right and have good insight in your ear and not have to wait until potentially a name being called, but have the resources to take care of your family and take care of them right now. Hats off to Travis Hunter and the Hunter family, man. What a beautiful, you know, video that started on, on Travis's YouTube channel. And of course, everyone has picked it up. But, man, you just can't script a better story than to have a, a young person, you know, who's still not even draft eligible yet, you know, going into this season and able to buy mama a house. You know, I, I think, you know, one of the things that just always stands out about Travis Hunter is that he is his own man. Uh, obviously, he started at Jackson State, did not finish there. But so many people were like, what? Why would you do that? Oh, you just messed up your entire career. Um, he went there, enjoyed his time. And I, I think if Coach Prime would have still been at Jackson State, Travis Hunter would have been right there. He was obviously, you know, the connection with, with uh, Deion Sanders uh, was the, the biggest part there. Um, but I think that's something that you'll always be able to look back his time at an HBCU and what he has been able to do living up to the hype and doing it his own way. Um, I, I, I just think that that's one of the things that I admire most about people and, you know, especially athletes, because we, we study them so closely just because of the nature of our work. Yeah, don't get me wrong, Tali. I know that there are naysayers out there. You're going to always have a a vocal minority, if you will, in spaces like this. Some people call them haters, uh, but you know, just it doesn't pick up enough of my radar to even give a title to. But by and large, what you're gonna find, particularly in this new era of college football, folks ain't mad at folks that transfer. You know, when Joe Burrows left Ohio and won a national championship down there at LSU, you had Ohio people cheering him on because he was their guy first. And I hear nothing but well wishes, you know, from the HBCU community. Uh, from the Jackson State community for Travis Hunters and Shadur Sanders and Cameron Silver Craigs and JBs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on because they know they cut their teeth in the swag and prove that they can do it at that next level. Something that Coach Prime pushed back on and says, it's not the next level. Coaching is coaching and football is football. And, you know, we talk about that event in Boulder, that book tour uh, culminating in Boulder, Colorado. You actually had Jackson State fans who flew in to Denver, drove to Boulder to be at that event and, and support it. And so, you know, people are going to remember his playing days and what he accomplished at Jackson State and what he proved to the world he could do. And I think when he is, you know, uh, right there on that front row, two people from the same school being discussed with the Heisman, and then, you know, short time after that, two people's names being called in the first round of the draft, I think you're going to have HBCU to swag in Jackson State, celebrate as much as anybody because people know where they came from. And, and call me crazy. I, I have not done the analysis. I'm just going off the eye test. I think all those kids look more dominant at Colorado than they did at Jackson State. Not to say they weren't dominating at Jackson State, but <laughs> it, it's not like they went from looking like they were playing with a bunch of kids to people uh, on, on their level. Uh, I think they look more dominant w when they went up to Colorado than they did at JSU. I say well said, you know, because when you look at what Shadur and Travis uh, did against Alcorn and was fighting to do it, or against South Carolina State or, uh, or North Carolina Central, and look at what they were able to do in the Pac-12 against nationally ranked teams, uh, they did, quote unquote, move it faster and made it look easier. And that was up a level. These guys are who they are, man. Doesn't matter where they're from, you know, talent is talent. And they're going to have their names called on draft day early in that first round. Early, early in the morning. All right, uh, let's move on with the rundown. You are watching oh, the Rewind right here on the Pregame Show Network. NIL, we're just talking about that. Uh, Neely, I was just reading an article this morning, like right before we went on. Uh, there is just like a, a look, this NIL game is, is – it is a professional business. The, the collective at Colorado, they're looking at hiring – uh, first, they had a merger between like two different collectives to form like a super one. They're hiring like an executive director, sales force. They're talking about their budget needs to be like eight million per. Uh, Neely, it was not that long ago that you would get in trouble for getting an extra banana <laughs> in the cafeteria. And now we have just corporate apparatuses all around the nation supporting uh, these student athletes, and we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Neely, you have to keep up with that, no matter what campus you're on. Um, as much as you do with your, your strength and conditioning, 
uh, your nutrition program, your X's and O's, your Jimmy's and Joe's. I mean, your, your NIL program and how that's executed is just, your collective is, is just as big of a part of the equation as anything else. I think it's the greatest part of the equation outside of, you know, facilities and the resumes of your coaches uh, that are always going to be premium and attracting talent. Uh, but outside of that, man, you know, you're going to have to have a collective on your college campus. Uh, you're going to have to have NIL opportunities for your student athletes. And when you have mixed concerns, uh, when you have different groups, you know, that quote unquote have the same mission, why not combine that effort, you know, for the sole purpose of benefiting the student athlete? And that's just out, even outside of football. So you look at a typical college campus, you may have 300 to 400 student athletes that this now can benefit, not just having one for football, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so these partnerships that you see forming now in Colorado uh, that Coach Prime has, has blessed and endorsed and Shadur is in the first uh, opening commercial for it as far as the giving campaign, I think you're going to see that sweep across the nation. You know, this is something that started uh, to some degree in Texas A&M with these collectives and what they could do on and off the books, frankly. And now it's just a new wave of college football. You have to have it to compete. I don't care if you're in the power four. I don't care if you're the HBC level. You got to be able to compete with and beat your neighbor. And if your neighbor is doing it, you got to do it too and do it at a greater level. Uh, whereas Colorado is blessed with a, a un, 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 incomparable, I'm sorry, incomparable spokesperson and Deion Sanders, he still needs help. And that help is coming in the form of collectives that can put these student athletes in a position to be like Travis and do some things for mama well before you go to the NFL. Welcome to college football in 2024 and beyond. It is what it is. Um, if you want to clutch your pearls and wring your hands, uh, the toothpaste is not going back in the tube uh, on this one. Neely, I, I wonder as we continue to see, you know, the SEC and the Big Ten and their conversations and their ideas that they're putting forth and, and Greg Sankey appearing to be like the most powerful man in college football. Are these uh, big four, as you said, or are they going to break away and just no longer be a part of the NCAA and be their own governing body organization? And we're just going to have like the little guys will now be the NCAA and this other thing is going to be more just like, I don't know, the secondary uh, NFL, if you will. I think the train is, is on that track, but I think before you get, you know, to that uh, terminus, that, that final stop, I think there's some forks off the track, you know, such as right now we're down to a power four. Uh, I think that there's going to be more consolidation in the future, whether that is, you know, four, 12 or 16 years from now, you're going to have probably two major conferences in college football that could have anywhere between 15 and 20 teams in each one of them. And I don't know if it's the all state East versus the, you know, the I, state farm West. I was about to say, nearly just make it East and West. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly what's coming Tali, because the more and more, you know, that TV money and collective money, uh, NIL money has to influence this thing. Uh, there are going to be some people that just can't compete at that level, but they're still going to have to compete at the level that they are. And so whether you are, you know, in this power four or are you playing down at the at the next level, you know, organizing your collective, man, and being able to uh, entice and support and welcome student athletes to your program in school, it's just a part of college football now. Uh, you know, maybe this thing blows up in a couple of years and Congress has to get involved, but Right now, man, you need to be getting your ducks in a row and seeing what can I do uh, to compete with who I have to beat, you know, to get to a championship. Because if they're doing it, if my neighbor's doing it, I got to do it too, and I got to do a little bit more of it. You know, one thing I've kind of wondered out loud to myself is, uh, you know, TV pays money uh, for the rights, and, and they're getting their money from from advertising, subscriptions, and all that. I wonder if we get to the point where college football looks around and says, why don't we become our own TV or our own platform and just get all the ad money? <laughs> like, cause if you're paying a billion or whatever, you're, you're hedging your bets that you're going to make, you know, a billion and a half, I, two billion. I mean, I don't know. I think you're going to see that. Uh, I, I think that, you know, savvy commissioners and savvy athletic directors and, and savvy alumni organizations uh, can, can very easily get into the streaming business of their own content and if this, this, if this was the rap game, you would call it owning your own masters. Look at Colorado, what's taking place right now. Because of the NFL draft weekend, 
Uh, the spring game will not be televised live on ESPN because they're covering the draft. That has opened the door for Fox to bid on it. But in that same breath, because you're still calendar-wise in the Pac-12, you know, the Pac-12 has a network. But here's the killer. If none of that were to take place, just think if Coach Prime and his friends stream the game themselves. If he got The Rock on the phone, if he got Snoop on the phone and, and Lil Wayne on the phone and said, hey, for this weekend's event, let's combine, combine our streaming power and go live on all of our platforms, particularly Instagram. I mean, I mean, The Rock has 300 million followers, man. What, what a stream that would be. So I do think it's going to come a time and a place where some savviness is going to kick in and TV is not just going to dominate it. That streaming area is going to be ripe for harvest for somebody, you know, that has the business mind to go after it and own their own content. Bro, I mean, and, and shout out to The Rock. He is kicking ass right now. He is tearing Cody Rhodes out of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> He done beat that mo he done beat that man. Told him he's gonna tell his mama he beat that. I mean, The Rock is on top of his game right now. Um, this is gonna be the biggest WrestleMania as far as views and pay per view orders oh, in the history of it, man. Dude, they are doing an excellent job of of telling this story and setting it up. And what's so crazy is, and we're, and this is, I'll get back on track. <laughs> I get off track, but like it started, it felt like they were like. They just had to make a pivot because The Rock was going to wrestle Roman Reigns, and then everybody was like, Ugh, I don't want that. And then they're like, okay, Rock's going to be a bad guy. And then it just took off. And maybe that was their plan all along. I don't know. I love it. Um, it's it's great. It is compelling TV every Monday and Friday night. Uh, but anyway, I mean, just look at it, man. I, along with 100,000-plus other people, keep up with all things Colorado through the pregame show. Uh, you have well-off media. You 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 know you know the usual suspects that you go to to get your Colorado information, right? You know, I don't need ESPN or Fox or anybody to tell me what's going on uh, at Colorado, and and that's just during the week, and that's just during you know in the locker room and at practice and all that. Uh, I think what you said might be an unintended consequence, <laughs> like that just might kind of happen, and then some people are going to pay attention and be like. You know, I think we could really do all this stuff without as many middlemen that's in the picture. You know, Tali, never underestimate what can come from unintended consequence, unintended outcomes. It was like byproducts, like, hmm, didn't mean for that to happen, but look what happened. Prime example, no pun intended with using Prime and Coach Prime, prime example, Viagra was supposed to be a heart medicine. <laughs> but everybody came back from the trials testifying to other benefits, and they scrapped that heart medicine. Not that I know. Not that I know. <laughs> so sometimes... Now, now, if Viagra would help that, I would know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, Tali, you mean one thing and another thing happens. So uh, as TV... The, the TV deal or lack thereof is what killed the Pac-12 if you just want to be honest about it. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and then everyone started fleeing and now it's down to two schools. But I think you're going to still have that in the future. You know, when we talk about these two super conferences that just battle out from the east to west, what have you, uh, I still think there are going to be enough people left out the feeding trough that they can build their own trough and own their own content and do their own streaming. And there's going to be a market for it because most people are not sitting down on the couch watching TV. They're watching content from their phones and their iPads and their laptops. And so that stream game is going to be phenomenal in the future for college athletics. Because, bro, if you are at home on a Saturday, like college football is appointment TV, but you still got other stuff to do. I can't tell you how many times just taking Colorado. All right. And, you know, you could stream, you know, the TV streams or whatever. I had to go outside. Look, I had to cut the grass. So I, I, I contract, contracted my phone to be attached to the grass, the lawnmower handle. And I'm cutting the grass and I'm watching the game, you know, or I got, look, you got to go blow those leaves. And, you know, I'm like, you're going to find a way to do what you need to do on a Saturday. Uh, and still, like, you're not going to miss that game, even though your life might require you to, to make some moves on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. So um, I, th I think it's there. We'll see as time goes along. All right. Our final subject here. Let's talk about the coordinators. We have fresh new faces through the transfer portal on the field, but the guys with the clipboards and up top and down on the sidelines 
Um, a lot of new faces there as well. We had some turnover, uh, some promotions within the coaching staff. Um, has that had a, a noticeable, tangible impact through week one of spring practice, Neely? I, I think it has. Let's start on the offensive side of the ball first. Uh, Shadur Sanders and the relationship that he has been able to build uh, with Pat Shermer, who came in as an analyst uh, and then moved to co-offense coordinator and now has the reins all to himself as offensive coordinator. All during those three phases, his relationship and communication uh, between those two parties, Shadur Sanders and Coach Shermer, has only increased. Shadur knows uh, that Pat Shermer is a guy who knows what it's supposed to look like and how to get to the next level and what the next level is looking for. And he has a pro mindset in his offenses with creativity and that kind of thing. And, and so I think you're going to see an uptick definitely in the offensive production. And it just starts with relationship and their ability, you know, to communicate and communicate frankly uh, and honestly and talk about schemes and, and getting plays where Shadur's talents uh, are, are showcased as it relates to being on the same page with receivers, the running backs, and of course, that offensive line. Uh, then you look at Rob Livingston, who came from 12 years out of Cincinnati. Uh, he's a guy that knows what it's supposed to look like. He was a scout in the NFL, coached the cornerbacks in the NFL. And, and his openness uh, to say, look, I'm going to get the best 11 guys on the field. Uh, we're not playing any kind of favoritism ball here. We're going to run a defense you know, that highlights their skill sets, gets them in the right position to make plays. Uh, it is participatory. They communicate well. Uh, the defensive players, when you talk to them, they are enthused about it, excited about it. And I will tell you this, to the folks out there who follow Coach Prime at Jackson State, uh, this defense and this flexibility and his talent reminds me a lot of the Jackson State defenses for those two years of championship runs that Coach Prime had. All right, so you got a, you got a pretty interesting triangle there when you look at Livingston, the defensive coordinator, coached cornerbacks in the NFL for over a decade. You look at Coach Prime, the best to ever do it at that position. And then you look at Travis Hunter, the best doing it right now at that position. Neely, uh, the three of them get in the room and just start talking, man. They ought to be able to come up with some pretty exciting stuff. Like the synergy between those three should be pretty awesome. Yeah, and, and, and you held back some, Tali. You mentioned uh, three people, but I got another two I want to add in there. Uh, Kevin Mathis, who is Travis's position coach at corner, you know, played in the NFL, uh, uh, had a great career in the NFL. And on the receiver side of the ball, uh, Jason Phillips, uh, All-American at Houston, who caught all those passes from Andre Ware, his Heisman season, led the nation in reception when he was in college and also played pro ball. You know, they are in Travis's ear as well on the offense and defensive side of the ball. When you put in prime and you put in Shermer, and you put in Livingston, and you put in Phillips, and you put in Mathis. This guy has five coaches, have been there, done that, and know what it takes. It's going to be unbelievable when you see what it produces this season. And especially with them having an athlete uh, to be able to coach like Travis that, uh, look, I don't know everybody that's been under their watch, but, man, uh, they have a real gem to, uh, <laughs> to, to execute yeah. with this year. Yeah, it's not like they're coaching me and you on how to play receiver or quarterback. <laughs> No, they would be like, son, can you, do you know how to pedal? C can you backpedal at all? Do you need a bicycle to pedal out here? Uh, that's they, would what, give me, they would give me an application for the band. <laughs> Come carry this tuba there, Neely. Uh, all right, before we go, Neely, I, I like to get uh, off topic a little bit from the rundown. We, we, we've gone through all of our topics, but I, I like to always make it a little personal and rewind things in our personal life. So, Neely, this has happened to me maybe twice. Um, I'll be 50 years old in October. I will turn 50 before my son, uh, the youngest of uh, our children, turns five. So, you know, kind of an old dad, right? So I go to pick up my son the other day at daycare and his little friend that they always hanging out with, they're just, you know, tight like that. No, no, it's your papa. Your papa is here. Neely, how should I handle this little boy? <laughs> you, Charlie, you can't handle it. Father time I is undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> is there nothing that I can do with this other person's child? <laughs> Ooh, that's Tommy. That, that that made my day. That's a good one. Because as as a Paul Paul for real, you know, 
uh, my son had a son nine months ago and uh, you know it's been wonderful being a granddad but I cannot say that before that I was ever accused <laughs> as being a granddad uh, but yeah Tali I just hey man just you know uh, yeah it's getting a little salt and pepper up there and it's thinning and uh, you know they, they they see you getting out the car a little slower and they hear your bones cracking or you moaning when you get up and it's Paul Paul Tali going to pick up his grandson all true all true, all true. Uh, nothing like hey, that. Children, children don't job. lie. They no, don't lie. Let me, they you, don't let me lie. tell you two people. Don't, two people don't lie. A child and a drunk. Children don't. Children keep it a hundred and eighty-five percent all the time. I will shout out my son though. He was like, "That ain't my papa. That's my daddy." So at least he did <laughs> cape up for me. Yeah, and he's sitting with his chest. Yeah, he got big on. Yeah. He, uh, that's my daddy. What you talking about, fool? Uh, but man, that one hurt me. Nearly, it, it, it hurt me. America, it hurt me. It hurt <laughs> me bad. And, and then I told it to my oldest daughter, um, who's always clowning me. Uh, but she at least came in and said, uh, you know, Dad, you're you're not that old. You, you, your your face still looks fresh. So she, she'll earn her allowance this week. I love the use of the word that though. Uh, that was that was that made the sentence. You're not that old. I mean, I'm acknowledging you are old. You're just not that old. She comes for me. She comes for me all the time. All right. This has been <laughs> the rewind right here on the pregame show network. My man, Uncle Neely Jackson, Mississippi, old man river here in Atlanta, Georgia. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, Neely, oh, oh man, I'm going to Disney next week with seven, seven kids. Three of them are mine and my brothers and my sisters. So uh, Papa will be on the move. Uh, oh, you, they go really think you're. They go really think you're a granddad. They're told yeah. told seven. I'm gonna feel like one when I get back too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll talk to you next time.